So we have another podcast episode for the Awakening Legacy series for yes. this ah, book. <laughs> I'm really excited to have Lindani here. Welcome, Lindani. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Good to see you. I, I, need, I need to get some of this energy of yours. I need to just bring that. Maybe you could be in Scotland. That's probably why. <laughs> yeah, we're all like this in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited to um, have a chat with you because, you know, this is the first time we have actually spoken since our book launch event, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so I'm really excited to talk with you about your chapter and talk about um, in this podcast, we have the opportunity to dive a little deeper into your chapter, because let's face it, there's only so much you can write in one chapter, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. You, know, when you, write. yeah. you end up kind of it's actually quite restrictive, you know, I don't know what it was like for you, but I just found you know I was like oh I could oh this and that and these ideas and da 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 and yeah only so much could go in no no it's so true because um I would say though I think I think the word limit was helpful because I think that's a nice introduction into the writing world in terms of having mm -hmm. something published so that was that was fine in itself yeah but definitely um I think that when I think about it now I think that the word limit was was more of an introduction to that world of writing yeah and seeing it as an opportunity to start something you know so yeah it was challenging sticking to the word limit but also it just allowed us to be more focused on what we wanted to share and be more intentional yeah oh so, yeah great so what attracted you to the project well it's, it's it's quite interesting actually because as you know i did a talk for um a rebellious business yes um, and i'm glad i did it i'm glad i did it because look at this now because yes. if i didn't see that talk i wouldn't be here yeah and um and i was so sick on that day i remember i had tonsillitis oh yeah you could barely speak barely speak but listen when i when i when i am when i am living my purpose i get better for anything i get well instantly you know yeah so so um I remember, I remember telling my wife, I might, I might just cancel this, you know, but it's like, no, she's expecting me and stuff. So let me just show up. So when I think about it now, it's just amazing how much, um, you know, of a flower, you know, you can get out um, outside a, um, a messy soil or a rough soil, oh, you know, yes. so, so it, it's, it's, it's really, really a gift. I mean, when we, right after that, we spoke and you're like, you got this idea for this book and I'm like, Hey, let's make it happen so no thank you for having me on board and thank you for, for giving me that opportunity and starting something because i'm definitely going to write my own book now for sure yes yes and this is it you know this book mm -hmm. is called awakening legacy and what i love yeah. is that you know yes the intention is to share a message share our stories share um our passion and to awaken something in the reader but what I love is that something has been awakened in every single author who's yeah. contributed to this book yeah no no definitely I think um you know because you don't really get to think about these things you know you know life just happens and you keep happening and you keep you know just living in a way mm -hmm. um and you don't really take the time to reflect on some of those experiences because those experiences actually are a tool in your toolbox but if you don't if you don't really know what's in your toolbox toolbox you don't know what tools you have yeah yeah you know what i mean so it was it was you know it's it, it was fantastic having to sort of reflect back on those experiences that you know that we can use as tools because you you know never get to sit down and just start thinking about them but um you know the book the whole journey of the book and the experience of writing the book just kind of like emphasize the importance of you know, going back to your toolbox and open it and see what do I have in here that I can use mm. to keep building this house or this project, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, that I love your toolbox analogy. And I, you know, I talk about that a lot in the work that I do, you know, having like a toolkit of stuff you can use and, and knowing, you know, what tools work well for what, so you can just pull them out when you need them. And, we can often take it for granted that we have them 
or completely forget to use them, you know? And it, so it's like, you know, we're getting our shoe off to try and hammer that nail into the wall, forgetting we've got the perfect hammer, right? In our toolkit. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah, it happens like that because you're so, you know, life is happening and you're overlaying experiences. Mm. And um, in that process of overlaying, it's natural that, you know, you would sort of, you know, the other experiences that came before might just, you might just lose, lose on, on those experiences or lose being aware of those experiences. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that the willful, the willful intent to connect back with those experiences and not see them. And I think that's why my chapter, when I, when I talk to the power of separation is to, to not see those experiences, whatever they might be as a, as a, as a prison or a place where you're locked in, but as a place where you remind yourself that you can be something different or you can be more, you know, it's yeah. like, like your, it's like your rear view. You are aware you can see it. You take from it what you can take from it and you use it to, to keep moving on. But um, that was, um, that was the whole idea behind even the chapter I wrote. I was like, how can I reflect back on my experiences, but not just reflect back on them for the sake of it, but reflect back on them with the intention of saying, how do I use this as an opportunity to be aware of self and be aware of how I can use these past experiences as an elevator to elevate myself to the next phases in my life. You know what I mean? Uh Yeah. And so has that changed since you've had that space to reflect on that? Like what things have you done? Because I know recently you went to Gambia, right? Yeah. I went, I went to Gambia for two weeks. Listen, I was sitting here today. I was like, I need to go back to Gambia for a minute. <laughs> you know, I was in Gambia for two weeks. I had a bit of a business that I'm doing there. So one of my cousins, we have an export business in Gambia and I was just going to set things up. So uh-huh. I had a very busy two weeks, but it was, um, I def- when I got there, I definitely sort of connected back with the book because I was seeing things, you know, because a lot of the things I shared in the book is shared by so many people around mm-hmm. the world, particularly from that environment. So it was amazing to just see, you know, um, you know, see the mindset, see how people are moving, um, seeing people that are seeing opportunities and people that are allowing the idea of not having much to completely shape their whole life and how they view life. Mm-hmm. So it was amazing to kind of like connect back with that, but also go to some of the areas that, you know, where I grew up in and, 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 and look at it and say, wow, I used to be here yeah you know, uh, and, and not just physically but where is my mindset now what how was I thinking then why was I thinking that way you know and how am I how am I thinking now and how have I come to this place of thinking this way you know all those things were happening were going on in my mind but I'll tell you one thing though mm-hmm. that, that, that really stood out for me and I think this is a great reminder that your experiences of growth as much as they benefit you the person that's experiencing it you become a very, very powerful and influential mirror for others who have not yet started on that journey. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So going back home and seeing people I grew up with and me hanging around them and they see me, I'm working, I'm going up and down, no shame, no fear. I am relentless. They see that and they say, bro, if you're doing this, then we have no excuse, but to do better. And for me, that's where the satisfaction is because I'm like, okay, so whatever experiences I've had, I have, I am able to use that in a way that I can build a nice, comfortable house that's attractive enough for someone to say, let me come in and sit here and build my own. Yes. Yeah. Oh, how great that, that you know, being a, an inspiration and a way shower, you know, mm. that if I can do it, you can do it, right? You know, it's... Yeah. It's, it's all possible mm-hmm. for all of us. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. So what, what challenges, well, before, we, before I ask you about the, any challenges that you faced with the writing process, I want to just check in with you as well. Can you just say a little bit about, give us a little flavor mm-hmm. of what you think people would get out of reading your chapter? I think the I think I think the thing that people can get from reading the chapter is is really how you it's understanding perception. Mm-hmm. The perception of our experiences is something that we have control over. Yeah. 
whilst we might not have control over what has happened in the past, we have control over the perception of the things that have happened in the past. Yes, yes. And with that perception, um, the way you can have that perception or choose that perception is to think about the notion of having a growth mindset, mm -hmm. right? To, to have that mindset where you believe in, in the journey and in the process of things that things can get better and things will get better. It just requires your commitment to that idea and you want it to make you want it to be exactly that right mm -hmm. so when people, when people read that book i want people to to see the journey and my of, and my story as the beginning i want them to see the willingness to reflect on those little activities and experiences that seem like they don't count but make up a whole human being anyways mm -hmm. and be aware of theirs right and not see it as something that holds them back but let them see it as I want them to see it as an opportunity to say, okay, this is what it was. And this is this advice that I got from my parents or my upbringing was coming from a place of fear. Maybe it was the right thing then. It was the right thing then. But it's okay for me to separate from that because I have the power of separation. Yes. And, and I have the power of, of perception. So mm -hmm. I, will, I will have a different perspective with regards to my experiences. I am going to choose a perspective that allows me to be successful now and be successful in the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I want people to experience from that book, you know. Yeah, and yeah, I love what you're saying about the the you know the power of separation and perspective, you know. Um, and th at the end of your chapter, I was just looking earlier, actually, uh, just reminding myself and and. Um, you know what you were saying about the growth mindset i know you've there's an exercise that you've gifted in 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 the book there for people to really get a sense of how they can do that how they can move from a limiting mindset you know yeah. a fixed mindset to a to a growth mindset so um anybody is listening and, and you're wanting to find out a bit more like like how do i do that well it's in the book yeah. <laughs> it's in the book so you can have it's, it's in the book listen i'll share this with you know. quickly I, I was in gabby i've got a picture of a lady it's very common you know for you to see a woman um, having some fruits on her head selling and then she's got a baby on the back and then she's got another kid on the left side of the right arm that's something that I was seeing in Gambia every day that's just that's the norm yeah and I'm watching these women mostly women doing this for for little change what I would consider little change but mm -hmm. for them it means the world mm. you see the struggle on their faces and you see the resilience mm -hmm. and I see it and I say if these people or this woman here, right, has made no excuse, because yeah. she has every reason and she can't make an this, she has so many excuses she can make. Yeah. And she can do this, then I have no excuse. So for me, it was a beautiful reminder to say, if something, if someone is making everything out of nothing in a place that has very little to offer, mm -hmm. I have no excuse in a country where I come home and I don't have to worry about if there's light or there's no light. Yes, there's water right in the tap, right? <laughs> yeah. I have no excuse. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so I'm saying that to say that our experiences, our, our, our difficult experiences, they do not give us the license to use excuses as a legitimate reason to stay there. Do you know that's made me think of, of something. Mm -hmm. There's 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 no better the excuse than a really good one. You know? And yeah, we all have tough things that happen. And like you say, really difficult circumstances, you mm -hmm. know, but actually fundamentally um it, it doesn't serve us to allow that to limit limit us to keep us small and and stop us expanding actually you know exactly exactly also you know the notion of i believe in the notion of owning your past and owning your experiences mm -hmm. but there's one thing about ownership if you own your house you can choose to paint in whatever color you want yes yeah if you are a slave to your experiences then you don't own it your experiences own you Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I like that one. 
I think I've been, um, when I share these, I, I put a quote on them and I think that's going to be the one. Just say it again. I love that. I can't remember. You're going to have to the video again. <laughs> I'm going to have to listen back. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was, uh, yeah. The, um, yeah, it was about being a, a you know, a, a, a slave to your um, excuses. Yeah. Excuses, yeah. yeah. You, gotta, yeah. you have to own it, own it yes fantastic so did you have any surprises when you wrote your chapter was there anything that came up that you were like oh didn't expect that the clothing thing definitely I, I didn't I don't know how that came about but the idea of my mother buying me clothes bigger than my size this clothes I'm wearing right now the style is supposed to be bigger than my size and uh -huh. I've lost so much weight coming back from Gambia but um, the part where I wrote about my mother buying me clothes five times my size and shoes bigger than my feet, and she bought them with the understanding that, well, her justification was I will grow to fit in them. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I wasn't going that fast. Yeah. And by the time I, by the time they could really fit, they would have been worn out anyways. <laughs> yes. So we have to buy new ones anyways. Mm -hmm. But the logic behind them, I get it because she was coming from a place of not having much. Mm -hmm. But I realize how that thinking, I've brought that into my own life mm -hmm. where I am buying jeans and I'm buying clothes and I'm buying them bigger than my current size in the assumption that I will put on weight and, I'm, and I will keep, I'll have room to still wear them. Mm -hmm. But the reality is I've, be, I've been pretty much the same size for a very long time. <laughs> Right. So as funny as, as that sounds, that started get me thinking. I was like, what else am I overestimating or underestimating from that mindset of clothing and shoes? Mm. What mindset am I applying to other things that I'm trying to do? Like, I'm absolutely. Because, you know, I, I, I work as a coach. And when you find something in one area of your life, you can bet it's going to be all over your life in different areas. It might look slightly differently, but like when you start, like with that, like where am I, where else am I doing this? So anybody listening, ask yourself the question when you notice and you have that awareness, oh, I'm doing that thing. Like where else are you doing that? Where else are you running that story in your life? Uh, uh, you know, that's limiting you. Exactly. That was, uh -huh. the, that, that, I found it funny um, when I was writing it, but that was the one that really stood out to me. This assumption that, um, you know, um, that I, this mindset where I have to buy things two, three times my size, because, you know, there might not be enough for me to, for me to buy again. So I buy them in, in the eye so automatically I'm already operating in a mindset of, of lack yes and I bet so many people do that I know I've definitely you know have my programs around lack as well I think most of us do so you know again asking that question like where wh where am I doing that you know in in my life you know and uh, so that we can have that awareness be able to let go of that you know exactly because exactly. whatever you're not aware of it could it could potentially own you yes and you're not knowing because you're not aware of it yeah and that's the thing those things that are in our blind spot they're running our lives right we have yeah. habits based on that automatic programming that exactly. has been running but once we see it we can then shift it exactly we can write a new program <laughs> Exactly. And literally create new neural pathways. I mean, it's a, it's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. What we can yeah. do. That's yeah. just phenomenal. Yeah. But that was the one that stood out for me in the book. I, I find it hilarious, you know. Um, so what didn't you include? What did mm -hmm. I include? Hmm, that's a tough question because... I could have, because I could, you could, I could write so many words on all of my experiences. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's something I really, really have to think about. What did I include? Because I didn't really have, I didn't really cut anything because I was writing with, 
you know, it's like I, it's like I had an essay, and and even back in university, when I'm writing essays, I tr I try not to go over the word limit, so I'm very aware of the word limit. So I'm disciplined when it comes to word limits. Yeah. But um, unlike me, I was just like, oh, oh I've got all this. <laughs> I wrote down exactly what areas I wanted to touch. I didn't know how long, but I was aware of the word limits. I was playing around that. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking what 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 is not in that book that I would I would I felt I could have included in that book. Mm. Um, I think maybe um, just what it means for me to be a a, a man. Yes. Oh, beautiful. You know, what it means for me to be a man now compared to growing up. What being a man. What being a man um, was growing up. Compared yeah. to what being a man is to me now, you know. Oh, oh my gosh! Like we've already been on twenty minutes, and I'm like, oh, we've just opened up a really juicy <laughs> inner conversation. Well, yeah, and 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 dealing with that reality, but dealing with that reality because I'm aware of what it meant growing up, being what being a man was. And what did it mean? Uh, I think growing up, being a man was. The first thing is not to be accountable. Mm. Interesting. I feel like growing up, the idea of manhood, a big part of that was not being accountable. Accountable to the environment, accountable to women, accountable to your children, that you can speak anyhow you want to speak. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that you could communicate anyhow you wanted to speak. Um, and that dominance was more about you being on top of others instead of empowering others. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even when I think about teachers back in school, I hated school for the same reasons where, you know, especially particularly male teachers would express that same toxic masculine expression of manhood mm -hmm. to the point where you don't even want to be in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But whatever people do to you for a lot, after a while, you become that same thing, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, you know, just me being aware of some of those tendencies and, um, uh, and, and dealing with that in itself and making that conscious shift, mm -hmm. you know, we've been going back to Gambia, for example, you know, um, um, it really gave me an opportunity to see that shift and see the, some of the struggles and also some of the overcome, some of the wins in terms of the, in terms of the mindset, you know, mm -hmm. um, that feeling of entitlement, you know, growing up feeling entitled just because you're a man, I'm a man because I'm entitled to this, things are supposed to go my way because I am the man, you know, and you, mm -hmm. and you play out in society, you know, you see the women, for example, um, you know, selling with the baby in the hand and something on their head and they're moving around on the 30 something degrees heat and the guys are sitting outside waiting for lunch, waiting for that same woman to come cook and then, you know, tell them, oh, come in, food is ready. Mm hmm you know so uh, an idea of manhood where you are entitled to be i remember this i went out one night and one guy, one guy was asking a girl that i went with a few friends of mine and um he was like oh who's your boyfriend and she was like she was like i don't know she didn't want to answer the question and then she was like but you don't even know if i have a boyfriend maybe i'm not interested in boyfriends and then he automatically went into this but you should have, if you, you, um, you should only, you should have a boyfriend and, you know, almost, it just instantly switched into this. I am, I am entitled to tell you what your life is supposed to be. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then I said to him, I, you know, and then he said things like it, it would be between you. I think the girl was playing around and was, she, she was like, oh, um, I don't like boys. I like girls or something. And instantly he went again into, well, it's going to be you and your grave. So I, I got, I, I got involved and I was like to him, who, who told you that it's your responsibility to tell her how she should live her life? And mm -hmm. he said, because I'm, I'm a man. That was his, that was his response. Woo. So I was like to him, but what does that mean? What does being a man mean? Cause I'm, and I was getting so agitated by his response, but also I could understand, I could sympathize with it because I get where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. But that was a reflection for me to be like, wow, like the notion of being a man or being this person who's automatically given this green light to have a say in dominance, toxic dominance over everything and not being accountable for self. Uh -huh. that, that manhood, if I was to write about that in a book, I think it would be the whole book. But yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, sorry, the, our, our government just popped into my head, right? <laughs> 
but uh, I won't get political on here. Uh, but, you know, it's just like that viewpoint um, is, uh, is so limiting for everyone. For everyone. For everyone. For and everyone. like you say, it's toxic. It's poisonous. And um, so I get that's like uh, an old, or is it so old? I mean, gosh, version of manhood. So what, what, is, what is your view of what manhood really is then? I think that a big part of, um, when I think about myself or being a man, I think the mm -hmm. first thing I think about is, Am I creating a safe, safe space? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's interesting because that uh, the word that came into my head was protector. Like, yes. Yes. you know, yes, taking responsibility to protect. Yes, and, and so that's not that's not way. dominate or overpower. You know, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. there's a real difference there. It's it's more creating a safe space. Because yeah. the protect the, the protecting takes us back to, I think that the the notion of protecting has been misconstrued in a way. Yes. Yeah. Um, where where you're only protecting, um, you're protecting against an external force. Mm -hmm. But really and truly, most people's nightmare and headaches are the people that are within their circles. Yeah. Yeah. Right, the men, the brothers, the uncles that are around. Yes, yeah. So if you're busy protecting, yeah, yeah, getting that hold on, maybe I actually, I actually am supposed to protect these people from me. Yes. But you don't think about that when you think of protecting. But no. when you think of the word or the expression of creating a safe, safe place. Yes. Then you include yourself in that discussion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now it becomes a because I see the difference when I'm talking to when I was in Gambia, I'm talking to young women in particular. And I'm encouraging their viewpoint and I'm telling them, I want to hear what you think. Or when I went to the university and I was doing a leadership workshop, I want to hear what you think. Mm -hmm. And you can see them, it's a struggle to just say what they think. And you're like, wow, like- Well, when nobody's listened to it. Nobody's listening to them and, and automatically mm -hmm. also, that's what they've known that their moms have done the same thing, their grandparents have mm -hmm. done the same thing. So now they're also doing the same thing and, and staying in silence. But essentially, if I was to write a book around manhood, I would say, that for me, manhood is about creating a safe space. Mm, yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the part of this book, like I could have easily have just called in women for this book, right? I work a yeah. lot with women and I'm really passionate about empowering women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, traditionally we have had, you know, have not been heard and not had these safe spaces, right? But one of the things with this book and the the soul, the energy of this book, I mean, I was really clear, and which is why I reached out to you after I met you with your sore throat and everything at that <laughs> talk was what I saw was this, this sense of the divine masculine energy, you mm -hmm. know, that 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 energy that creates safe spaces right for people to be heard for people to be seen that yeah. sense of equity yeah. and and so i really it was really um important to have that divine masculine aspect within this book yeah. um and a first for the unbound press because they haven't had any books with male authors in before you know it's just yeah. like this book has been so unbound so like um yeah just like blowing it all wide open you know for the publishers as well you know um but to have that's something that had been coming through for me over and over was like this importance of the feminine and the masculine. I do a lot of work with parents and just yeah. having like important of having, having dads, like working with both parents, you know, feeling really important as well. Um, yeah. So to I, I think, I think the, you know, sometimes when people are in so much pain, they move so far away from the, they, they make, they make certain decisions that are so 
away from whatever's causing them that pain that they can recreate something else and they might be missing out a lot and that's um, normal i can totally understand that but my thing is always that when men women um whatever you might refer to yourself humans in all shapes or forms mm -hmm. when we do not understand and appreciate the power of collaboration mm -hmm. and that we all individually have our own strengths yeah the force of the universe is essentially buried in the diversity of our strengths then we are missing out on life itself mm -hmm. yeah just it's 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 really that you know, I when, love what you just said. The force of the universe is buried in the diversity of our strengths. Wow, yeah. I love that. Yeah, write that and send that to me because I want. Yeah, to I've, I've just I'm gonna write that down. Um, well, I'm gonna have to listen back to it, but yeah, I because I want to be ugh, completely present with you with this. Yeah. I just yeah, there's um some great nuggets out of this conversation tonight. Um. So what, what do you want to leave our listeners with from this conversation? I would say, you know, go out there and do it anyways. You know, um, mm -hmm. I was reading a book by Seth Godin called Practice, and he was just talking about the idea of doing it, you know, do, do, do the thing, just do it. And I would say that, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever brings you joy, mm. do it. Yeah. So, you know, we wake up every day because we've been waking up every day for decades and we feel so entitled to waking up that we don't <laughs> actually understand that waking up is a privilege. Yes. Yeah. You know, that the only license you have was, was the license to be alive now and yesterday. Yeah. And you wake up, you, 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 despite the, the doubt, doubt, fear, you know, imposter syndromes, whatever you call them, and are, are, are nowhere as powerful as mm -hmm. the understanding that you only have today to do what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. And embracing those feelings and say, I know you're here. Thank you. Cool. Grab a seat. But let me get my coffee. I have work to do. Mm. Like, making it count because that's what this book is about. At the end of the day, People are going to remember you if you give them a reason to. Mm -hmm. And it's, they, they, they don't, I don't want people to remember me for what I have done. I want people to remember me for the fact that I, I did it when I didn't feel like doing it. I did it when I doubted myself. I did it when society said I'm a woman or I am black or I'm short or I'm skinny or fat. I did it anyways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what I want people to remember me for. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, to anyone listening, be remembered for the fact that you came around and you gave it a good shot. Mm. Do you know, in my group today, I would I asked the question, if you were to honor the masterpiece that you are, what would you choose? Wow. What would you choose for your life? What would you choose today? You know, question. what would you do? What would you choose? Because, wow. you know, we we are all masterpieces. We are all the authors of our stories and we all have this gorgeous power and limitlessness within us. I mean, we are made of the same stuff as stars. I mean, it's incredible, you know, and if we remember that, you know, if we were are remembering who we truly are, hmm. like what choices do we make from that place? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. But you know, uh, I've just been loving this conversation tonight and it feels yeah. like it's that's a, a great place to sort of bring this to a, to a close. So, um, Lindani, where's the place you like to hang out the most where people can connect with you? I would say Instagram, even though to be fair, I, 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 I've been cutting down on Instagram. I delete the app and then upload the app just to kind of give myself breaks in between. But I would say the best place to connect with me is LinkedIn, actually. LinkedIn is the best place. You know, you drop me a message on LinkedIn, I'll find yeah, it. Yeah, I've, I've sussed that out. I'm like, 
Where do I message him where he'll see it? It's LinkedIn. You message, you message <laughs> on Facebook. I'm telling you, I'm not going to see it anytime soon. Um, you know, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is a great place to, to meet me. Or just, just drop me an email. Um, um, it's connect at iamblindani.com. Um, just drop me an email. But also just listen to some of my poetry. Um, yeah. I have a whole poetry collective out there, Voices of Victory. And, it and, and, and they're on your website, aren't they? They are on the website. Yeah, so, so the link will be, so if anybody's going like, where do I find that? Okay, the link is in the comments below here. So have a look. Yeah. You can click on the links. You can listen to some of his gorgeous poetry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, that's where they can, that's where they can find me. Brilliant. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to it's chat with pleasure. you tonight. It's Thank a pleasure. We, we, should, we should speak more often. Yeah, we should do more of these, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for just the good energy that you have, your patience, your consistency, and pushing it through and making making this whole thing happen. So thank you. Thank you for being a light, you know. Um, so thank you. Thank you for doing your own part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindani. Yeah. 